What's up, Badger fans? We got a lot to talk about today. We're going to start previewing a monster recruiting weekend that's coming up in June, plus a commit we haven't talked about. And what if Tanner Mordecai is bad? <laughs> Let's talk about all that and more in today's Locked On Badgers. Let's go on Wisconsin. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to another episode of Locked On Badgers, your team every single day. I really do appreciate everybody tuning in. I'm your host, Ryan Herrings, as always. Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends over at Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash college, and when you enter promo code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti-style tumbler with every order. All right, let's just get into it again. We, we try not to waste a lot of time on Locked On Badgers. We just jump into it. So, we need to start talking about the June 2nd recruiting weekend that's coming up for the Wisconsin Badgers football team. Luke Fickle, Mike Tressel, that recruiting staff, it's a monster one. It is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is one of the recruiting weekends that's going to help make or break this recruiting cycle. I don't think that's hyperbole. It's not the be all end all, but the prospects coming in, you got to lock a couple of them down. You have to. Um, and we need to start talking about it. Now, when we get a little closer, we're going to have Brian Smith on. We're really going to go through the prospect list. We're going to do another deep dive on it. But I want to start just introducing some of the dudes coming to campus because this is, again, it's been a minute. It feels like Luke Fickle came in, Phil Longo came in, and it was Phil Longo tweeting um, another offensive weapon. There are quarterbacks dropping out of the sky like paratroopers into Camp Randall. The recruiting momentum was incredible. You finished up that cycle by flipping Amari Snowden and Jonas Takluna. And then you had 14 transfers, and Mabry Metoyer happened pretty quickly. Tretch Kekahuna reflipped, Jamal Howard, Coach Scruggs sang from the top rope. And then it feels like a bit of a, I don't want to say drought, but it does feel like a bit of a recruiting drought. Wisconsin's missed on some dudes. Um, Dylan Johnson was a defensive lineman they were really in on, kind of a, a thick set defensive tackle, wrestling background. He committed to Northwestern. That's a loss. You lost Sexton to Penn State. We talked about some of these. Um, it's been, I don't want to say lackluster. That's the wrong term. But it's been a minute here. But this June period coming up, specifically this June 2nd weekend, is enormous for this program. And let's just highlight a couple of the players. And it's more than this. Like I said, we're going to continue to take a deep dive on this because the importance of this weekend for this recruiting cycle is paramount. Um, but let's talk about some of the dudes coming on the campus. Let's start here. Uh, Darian Dupree is coming to campus. Official visit. Dupree, uh, someone Badger fans are probably familiar with if you've been following this recruiting cycle. A 5'11", 190-pound running back out of Chicago, Illinois. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's, you know, again, it's it shows this staff's commitment to that Illinois, that Chicago area. They did it a lot last cycle. They're hitting it a lot this cycle. Uh, Corey Smith, the in-state running back, committed to Penn State. And a lot of people said, well, that's okay as long as we land – a, a really good replacement. Well, Darian Dupree checks that box. Okay. If you lose Corey Smith, the in-state uh, running back, but you land Darian Dupree, you're fine. Darian Dupree is an elite running back prospect. He's a high three-star kid, uh, offers from the in-state Illinois, Notre Dame's in on him, Michigan's in on him. So it's an elite offer list. And he, you're talking about a player who has electric contact balance. He just doesn't go down. His film is so much fun to watch. I mean, people are pinballing off of him. He's able to break a lot of tackles. He has elite speed. When he when he hits that gear, he outruns angles all the time. Um, good inside the tackles. Also, really good vision. You know, they'll pitch outside, toss to him, and and you'll see him kind of let the offensive lineman lead the way, and then pick and choose, put the foot in the ground, and get north south. Again, very difficult to tackle, uh, and just elite elite speed. So Darren Dupree's coming. That's a big big one for the Badgers. A Plan A type at running back, and we talked about the areas on the team that. The depth chart isn't very isn't I almost said the depth chart isn't very depthy, but the depth chart's not very deep. Running back is one of those spots. This is probably a class you need two running backs, or you need a running back and somebody in the portal, right? Because it's likely Braylon Allen leaves after this year if he does what we think he's going to do. Ches Malusi will be done. And then what are you looking at in that cupboard? You're looking at Nate White. Uh, you're looking at Jackson, Jackson Acker. You're looking at Kay Giacomelli. There's a lot of unproven question marks there. There's talent there. But you need two bodies to cycle, and Darian Dupree's at the top of that list. Again, explosive, explosive athlete. Um, yeah, I'd be very excited if they land him. And again, if they land him, 
losing Corey Smith to Penn State is not a big deal. It's okay to lose in-state talent if you replace it with light talent. The issue for Wisconsin has always been you haven't been able to replace a guy like Corey Smith with somebody out of state, right? But if you can replace it with somebody of the same type of talent or even better, yeah, that's fine. It's not a huge deal. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Marion Stewart is also coming. We've talked about a Marion Stewart before. A Marion Stewart, it's interesting because this receiver room is loaded, right? A Mar- uh, let me start here. Marion Stewart is a four-star receiver, again, out of Chicago, again, that Illinois area. Big time offer list. Notre Dame's in on him. Michigan's in on him. Tennessee's in on him. Um, and you've already landed Kyan Barry Johnson, who said, I'm probably going to be the only receiver in this cycle, right? You have an absolutely loaded receiver room. The fact that they're still after our Marion Stewart, the fact that he's still coming on campus, that tells you what they think of him because they don't need another receiver this cycle. They don't even need a receiver this cycle, which, by the way, also tells you what they think of Kyan Barry Johnson, that they, they took him that early. Um, read that, read into that what you will. They could be, uh, they could afford to be incredibly picky and choosy at receiver because of the depth at that spot. And they took Kyan Barry Johnson really early, and they're still going after Amarian Stewart. That tells you what they think of both these young athletes. Now, where Amarian Stewart is special, and again, a four star receiver, Chicago area, where he's special is every receiver we talk about, or I shouldn't say everyone, a lot of receivers we talk about, we talk about their niche, right? Where do they fit? Kyan Barry Johnson, I think he's more of a slot guy. Maybe he could play outside. You know, Keontes Lewis, he's a deep vertical. Uh, C.J. Williams, he's a physical possession receiver on the outside. Team Ray DK, he's kind of a possession guy. Uh, Marion Stewart fits a lot of boxes. That's what makes him special. That's why he's a four-star talent. That's why a lot of the Blue Bloods in the country are after him. You can play him inside. You can play him outside. He has deep speed. He has great hands. He has good size. He can high point a football. He's physical. He can break tackles, right? He's one of those chess pieces that you can really move around the board and be completely okay with it. And Phil Longo would have a field day with a guy like him. So that's why they're still after him. Again, they don't need more receiver talent. The fact that they're after them should excite you, Badger fans, because they they want him despite the surplus, right? And that tells you he's a player that they think is a difference maker. He's not a run-of-the-mill athlete. He's coming up June 2nd. Um, let's go Anelle Lafella. No, Anelu Lafale. Gosh, dang it. Anelu Lafaele, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um so he's, he's one coming out. This is a high school Wisconsin's got in a lot. And again, I apologize profusely for butchering that name. I think I got it in the last chance. But East St. Louis High School in Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii is a powerhouse. That's where Nick uh, that's where Nick Herbie came from, right? That's where Trechka Kahuna was from. Kamoi Latu started off there. So powerhouse high school. Um, Lafele is 6'2", 215. When you watch his film, he's he's got a lot of Pac-12 offers again, by the way. So this is another pretty highly sought-after prospect, um, high three-star kid. When you watch his film, it's hard not to see some Nick Herbig parallels, right? Because he's not the biggest dude. 6'2", 215, 220, not the tallest kid, doesn't have a huge frame. But his get-off is incredible as a defensive end, as an edge. I think, I think he's actually more of an outside linebacker prospect. I don't think he's going to have the bulk to play edge. But his get off is incredible. The term shot out of a cannon doesn't even apply to him, right? Because cannons are old school, like, you know, man of war, British stuff. Like th- he shot out of a howitzer. He's modern and he covers space in space so quickly. You could just see Luke Fickle and Mike Tressel using him in all sorts of spots. He can drop back in zone, he can cover, he can rush. He has some of that Zach Bond get off. And not to put those type of comparisons on him, Bond was an NFL guy, Herbig's an NFL guy. But he is that type of get off where he comes around the edge and people can't even deal with him. They can't get a hand on him, right? He's playing special teams. Uh, his speed got him some blocked punts where he just, again, outran the punter being able to get the ball off his foot. This is an elite speed edge defender. And you need those dudes to play Ohio State in space. You need those dudes to cover up athletes at Penn State and Michigan and USC, right? Coming into the conference, USC are going to put on the field. So another just huge target. And another one, this one's interesting too, because this is a guy. We all hearken back to the previous staff, and listen, we had our issues with the Paul Chris staff at times, but one of the dudes on that staff we did not have issues with was Bobby April. Bobby April III could identify guys. This is a guy that he was after, too. This is a player the previous staff was after and the current staff is after. So if you marry up the evaluation skills of Luke Fickle, Mike Tressel, and Bobby April and Jim Leonard, this is is a must-get. This is one of the highest targets on the defensive board. Uh, he brings an element of speed and chaos and explosiveness that this defense desperately needs to compete against the elite athletes. So that's another big one coming to campus. 
You have Dominic Nichols, a four-star defensive end out, defensive end out of Maryland, uh, another highly rated edge defender. This one's a little bigger, 6'5", 240. Um, he's, he's more of your do-it-all defensive end, whereas uh, LaFelle is that kind of explosive. You probably have to move him around a little bit. You can't have him taking on blocks. Um, Dominic Nichols can take on blocks. He can play at the point. He can get play. He's a three-down defensive end. Um, and again, an elite talent offers Michigan, Penn State, Kentucky. Um, you have Kevin Haywood, a four-star offensive tackle, 6'7", 295 coming. He's from Pennsylvania. <clears throat> so again, this is just kind of the introductory uh, press conference, right? The in introduction to this June 2nd recruiting weekend that's a couple weeks out. Uh, I'm going to keep talking about it, but I just want to highlight some of the key players. There's more than that coming, and there'll probably be more that continue to trickle in. It's one of the recruiting weekends that this cycle will either be built successfully on or where we're going to have to scramble to fill out if we don't hit that out of the park. I say we like I have some role in that. I have no role in that. But the Badgers recruiting staff has an elite group of talent coming in June 2nd, uh, really headlined by five or six guys that would all be plan A difference maker type recruits. So uh, very excited to see where that goes. Coming up, we're going to talk about a recruit we haven't really had the chance to talk about yet. Uh, somebody that committed. We're going to talk about the next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our good friends over at Bird Dogs. Listen, I'm wearing my Bird Dogs right now. Uh, you can't see it because it's, you know, the podcast doesn't show up, but I got my Bird Dogs on. My wife loves them. They're incredibly comfortable. Uh, they have great pockets. I mean, they're just, they give me, again, like I am a cre creature of comfort. I've talked about it to the point where I occasionally get confused and mis mistaken as a homeless person, right? People thinking that I am actually a homeless person. Because I dress for comfort so much. Some of my clothes don't look the part. Uh, bird dogs give me that comfort, but they also give me the versatility of going out and, and looking like a not homeless person, which sometimes is important. My wife, it's important to my wife that when we go out, people aren't trying to hand me dollars. And bird dogs helps me accomplish this versatility in my wardrobe. Um, again, I have them on today. My wife loves them. I wore a, poor, a pair yesterday as well. Bird dogs is kind enough to send us a couple. And right now, if you there's a great offer. If you go to birddogs.com, Lockdown College, again, our good friends, when you enter promo code Lockdown College, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. You're going to thank me later. You want comfort, versatility, and style? Bird Dogs is the ultimate mashup of those three things. So, birddogs.com, Lockdown College, when you enter promo code Lockdown College, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. All right, I want to say thank you again for everybody tuning in to Locked On Badgers, making this one of your first listens every day. Uh, I really do appreciate everybody doing that, honestly. Um, if you're one of the everydayers, you're here with us every day. You know, tomorrow you're going to hear uh, some recruiting news. If you're here with us the day before, you heard um, Justin and I chop it up over a big basketball commit, our big basketball visit. So if you're here every day, I really appreciate y'all. If you're one of the everydayers, thank you so much. All right, let's talk about a commit that we haven't really talked about much. But we do have to fire the cannons. I should have done this earlier, and I feel bad about it. Let's fire those cannons. Fire the recruiting cannons. Another one is headed to Madison on Wisconsin. Okay, so Wynn Stang committed to the University of Wisconsin a, a week and a half ago, so preferred walk-on. I'm going to tell you why we need to pay attention to this and why it's not the run-of-the-mill walk-on. No, what, what run-of-the-mill walk-on, sorry. Winston, let's start with the vitals. 6'1", 195 pounds, um, McQuantico, Wisconsin, Gatorade Player of the Year. Listen to this number. Listen to this stat line. And trust me, I know as well as anybody that high school stats are not the be-all, end-all for a myriad of reasons. But just listen to these numbers. 2,700 yards as a senior rushing, 8.4 yards per carry, 42 touchdowns. I'm just going to repeat that, right? 2,700 yards. 8.4 per tote, 42 touchdowns, okay? Uh, he had a game against Sun Prairie East. It was the second game of the season. He ran for 470 yards and six touchdowns on 36 carries. 470 and six touchdowns. Um, 55, 54, yards short, uh, 54 yards short of the Wisconsin State record. Also an all-state lacrosse player, big-time athlete. Why do we have to pay attention to this one? Why is this one important? And I've talked about – I don't talk about every walk-on that commits. And it's not because I'm dismissive of it. I just, some I look at and I kind of am like, mm, I don't really know. I don't want to try to sell every player necessarily because I don't really believe it. Um, I have talked about guys like Luna Larson, right? Recent from last year's cycle, who I thought was a really nice pickup campaign. Uh, I had Will McDonald on the show. Um, this is another one here with, with Wynn Stang, who when you look, let's just connect some boxes here. 
when you look at the frame 6'1", 195, he checks that box. That's big enough to play in the Big Ten, right? That's big enough to play major college football. So he checks that box. So when you start looking at walk-ons, you have to say, well, what's missing and what boxes do they check? He checks the frame, 6'1", 190. Um, he's going to be 6'1", 200 in college. He checks the productivity, all right? And then you start to look at the film. And yes, there, there's there's a reason he's a walk-on. Again, I'm not, I am not here to make out a walk on as the next four star player, but we as Wisconsin fans better than anybody know some of those things do happen, right? Some of that is possible. And this is a guy you have to keep your eye on because when you watch the film, there's a lot to like as a running back, right? And I'm going to get into why the position is important too in a second, but there's a lot to like there, right? It's, it's the size, but he has good vision. He runs between the tackles. He has good foot placement. He's able to, to break tackles, make cuts. He's not just Sometimes when you see a high school player put up huge numbers, it's literally because they're a man amongst boys and they just run straight and people are like falling off of them, right? And he's swatting them away like they're gnats. That's not what he's doing. There is some of that, but he's also making cuts. He's being decisive. He's seeing the hole. He's showing patience. And then he's running through arm tackles. Okay, there's a physicality to his game that's interesting to me. He runs through arm tackles. He'll put the shoulder down. Uh, I, he catches the ball well as well. He's He's kind of got some of that that out of the backfield swing pass uh, arrow route versatility. I think he can do some of that. Maybe a third down possibility, third down back possibility. There's a lot to like there with the frame, the productivity, the physical running style, some pretty good vision and hands. You can find all that in a 6'1", 190 pound frame. And by the way, he's talked about, I'm coming into Wisconsin with a chip on my shoulder, right? This is per uh, Bucky's fifth quarter. He said, definitely will be a chip on my shoulder. Although I know I'm going to be in a great spot, I'll be treated well knowing the walk-on culture at Wisconsin. So that size, that productivity, good vision, good hands, coming in with a chip on his shoulder. And by the way, he also mentioned the walk-on tradition at Wisconsin. I know I'll be treated well. That means the current coaching staff, the Luke Fickle staff, is still communicating that walk-on tradition to people. I like this one a lot. And then we talk about position. Where are we short on this team? I talked about it in the first segment. you got to get Darian Dupree. You probably need two backs this cycle. Where are we short on this team? We're kind of short at running back. Now, I'm not projecting Win staying to come in and be, you know, anything more than a depth piece to start, but you start to put these pieces together. And if you're trying to project out playing time for a walk on, you're looking at does he check these boxes? And he does check some of these boxes. And does, is he at a spot where maybe there's some potential room? And he is at running back. So I think it's somebody you got to track. I think this one's really interesting. I, I enjoyed the film. I encourage everybody to watch it. I'll tweet it out at some point if you haven't seen it. He's an athlete, again, a big-time lacrosse player, first first team All-State lacrosse player as well, so multi-sport athlete. I think those things translate, especially a sport like lacrosse where there's a lot of open space, you need vision. Uh, I think that translates to football pretty well with foot foot speed, uh, footwork, uh, translates well to running back. And a guy who can catch the ball out of the backfield. You know, last year's cycle, we took Nate White. This is a position where we do, Wisconsin does need depth, so... I would track it is all I'm saying. I would not write this off as a run-of-the-mill preferred walk-on. So I think that's a pretty big get. I meant to talk about it earlier, but when staying coming to Wisconsin, I think it's a big deal. Uh, I, at least, I shouldn't say big deal. I think it's a big enough deal you need to put it back in, in the memory banks of your brain somewhere and realize in two years we could be looking back at this and saying, ah, oh, this guy didn't just come from nowhere, and, and now he's a third down back for Wisconsin. I like him. He, he looks pretty natural and fluid and, and physical out there. I could see that road happening for Win. So I'm interested in that. All right, we're going to take a quick break for our friends of the show. Come back. And we're going to talk about uh, an interesting question that I don't think a lot of Badger fans have spent a lot of time talking about. What if Tanner Mordecai is not good this year? What if he's bad? We're going to talk about that next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, a quick break for our friends of the show. All right, I want to say thank you again for everybody tuning in to Lockdown Badgers, one of your first listens every day. Y'all are amazing. Uh, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to have any of your time during the day. It means more than I'll probably ever be able to eloquently uh, convey. All right, let's talk about this question. So good friend of the show and honestly a great person, uh, Dylan Graff. Go check out his works at Bad his work at Badger Notes. Him and his team, they're incredible. He put out a tweet the other day that got my brain kind of moving a little bit. And I've been thinking about this already. He put out a tweet that said, here's my, here's my projected offensive MVP, defensive MVP, sleeper this year. And for offensive MVP, he went Braylon Allen. Perfectly reasonable choice, by the way, 100%. I think Braylon Allen's the most talented guy in this team, probably. Um, but it got me thinking, if Braylon Allen's your offensive MVP, are we that different offensively than what we've been? Uh, certainly for informations and how we're going to look, yes. But Tanner Mordecai has to be your offensive MVP this year, in my opinion. He has to be. And 
it got me thinking, and I've had I had this conversation with Justin Rajiv a couple days ago because I've been thinking about this for a while. As Badger fans, we're all just penciling in Tanner Mordecai to be really good this year for the most part. At least I really haven't heard anybody talk about what if he's bad? What if it doesn't translate? What if it doesn't work? And I don't think there's a 0% chance of that. I don't think it's likely, but let's keep two things in mind, okay? The first is there's a reason Tanner Mordecai's at Wisconsin. Let's be incredibly – and we're I'm stoked he's here, okay? I want to be super – uh, incredibly rational with this. I'm stoked he's here. He makes our team way better. He raises the ceiling and the floor. He didn't jump into the NFL draft because he wasn't projected as a very high draft pick. That's why he came to Wisconsin to improve his draft stock as well. He should working with Phil Longo and these offensive weapons, showing it at a bigger stage. All this makes sense. But again, he's at Wisconsin because he wasn't projected to be a high draft pick because there was questions like he is not the shoe in that some Badger fans are necessarily thinking he is right. He's been a little turnover prone. He hasn't played the highest level of competition. Um, he has an NFL arm, but I don't think it's an elite arm. Again, I I'm not saying I'm just trying to play devil's advocate a little bit here. And Dylan's quote or his tweet about Braylon Allen. He thinks he'll be the offensive MVP this year. If, if he's the offensive MVP this year, Braylon Allen, to me, it means Tanner Mordecai is underwhelmed. And at that point, I don't know if the ceiling is as high for the Badgers as I had hoped it would be, right? Um, and it's not impossible that it happens. There's a, a confluence of things that could happen here where Tanner Mordecai facing teams he hasn't played before, a much higher level of defensive competition, uh, already being a little turnover prone. If he comes in and he starts pressing, listen, we saw him throw four picks in the spring game. If he comes in and he starts pressing because he feels the pressure to turn this Wisconsin offense around and he feels the pressure to improve his draft stock and he starts pressing, you could see some turnovers in really bad spots. And if that's the case where you have to go back and really rely on Braylon Allen, now I think Braylon Allen's going to have a great year. I think he's a great player and I think you can rely on him. But at that point, the offense might not be formationally, it'll be a lot different. But from a result standpoint, it may not be a ton different than we've seen in recent years. And I don't think the defense is going to be as good. And that's probably where you get that eight and four, seven and five season, right? If it's a Tanner Mordecai struggle for a lot of reasons that if you look at it at the end of the year and you say, if at the end of the year, you, someone, you, you were talking with a Badger fan and he said, man, you know, this season didn't go quite how I hoped. One of the biggest reasons I would have to think would be Tanner Mordecai wasn't as good as we thought he would be. And it turns out facing better competition, turns out he's a little turnover prone, turns out you know, it took him a little while to get confidence in this new system with these new weapons. I don't think any of those things would be incredibly crazy to hear at the end of the year, right? All, all of them kind of make sense in a way. And I just don't think we've really talked about it much. So it's interesting to me. Um, I still think, listen, all that being said, I still think he's going to do well. I think this offense is going to be better. I think it's going to be fine. But I think it's worth talking about. Let me know in the comments if you have any worries of Tanner Mordecai struggling this year. I don't think it's a 0% chance. Certainly not a 0% chance. I don't think it's a chance that's not worth talking about. And as you connect those dots, at what point would potentially another quarterback be, be looked at? Would that ever happen this year? I don't know. It's all interesting to me. But it's been floating around in my brain. Dylan's tweet fully brought it out further. I think if Wisconsin has a good year this year, Tanner Mordecai has to be the offensive MVP period. And I think if he's not, because it's a, again, college football, football in general is quarterback driven at this point. If he's not your best, your most impactful, right? Your most valuable player on offense. It's, it might not be as pretty as people think is all I'll say. Anyway, on Wisconsin, thank you all so much for tuning in. Really do appreciate it. Uh, we're going to talk again tomorrow for sure. Let's go and let's keep it going.